Raider Nation, welcome back to Silver and Black today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast covering your Las Vegas Raiders. Appreciate you guys being with us. If you don't already subscribe to the podcast, please help us out. Do that wherever you get your audio. You'll find us if you're watching us on YouTube, Rumble, uh, X.com, wherever, Facebook, wherever you're watching us, make sure you like the video. Make sure you subscribe on any of those platforms where you watch us and give us uh, give us a rating there. Give us a thumbs up. We appreciate that very much. Don't forget to turn on the notifications bell for Silver and Black today if you're on YouTube. That way, every time we have a new video, you will be the first to know. So thanks for being with us. I am Scott Colbranson along with my partner, Mo Moten. Mo is the senior NFL writer over at bleacherreport.com. You can catch his work there. You can also catch his Raiders work where he's a columnist over at sportsnot.com. You can also catch my work there, mostly video these days, but I got a Raiders piece coming up at some point uh, on sportsnot.com where I work as well. You can follow Mo on x.com at Mo Moton, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. When he's checked in there, you can find him, you know, because he needs his mental health, so he can't go on there all the time. I'm the same way. You can follow me at LV Gully. The show is SNB Today. Two months, 26 days until kickoff for the Raiders down in Los Angeles against the Chargers. Mo, minicamp has gotten underway. We're starting to get a little bit of um, reports from minicamp. It's not much different than OTAs in that the defense is far ahead of the offense. But we've been talking about that, haven't we, buddy? I mean, Luke Getze, new offense. You have, of course, Aiden O'Connell's back, but you have Gardner Minshew, new quarterback. you got new offensive linemen, uh, a new scheme. That's to be expected, isn't it? Should be expected, but there are some people out there who are already panicking because they're <laughs> they they think the offense is going to click right away. It I I will say I okay I haven't played on the NFL level obviously, but what? I will say <laughs> I will say that studying the game for as long as I have, I, I I would think I look at the offense as choreographed football, so mm. things have to be in sync. Your offensive lineman have to block clear lanes for your running back. Now, there are no pads, of course, but it's more choreographed than the defense having to just come down and just basically be disruptors. It's a lot easier, to, in my opinion, to be a disruptor mm. than it is to run a choreographed offense, especially a new system that you have to install with their new players, new coaches. So I wouldn't panic over the defense being ahead of the offense. I, I don't think you really see any type of, uh, how should I say, this progress. Until the pads, until they put the pads on. I I say I feel like I say this every year, Scott. I don't I don't really not that I don't pay attention to reports at this time of the year, but there's nothing really to um, dig into or read into too much until the summertime comes when there's actual hitting and something closer to actual football <laughs> being played on on the practice field. Absolutely. And, you know, th the thing is, and by the way, on today's show, we're going to get into this mini camp stuff. We'll talk about this. We're also going to hear and see, watch, if you're watching us, if you're listening to us, you'll hear Max Crosby talking about the defense. And then you'll hear Nate Hobbs talking about the quarterback battle. Of course, he's out there covering the likes of Devontae Adams, who's in uh, mini camp. Uh, we talked about that last episode. He's there. He is playing. And the rest of that offense, and and I think that's the key here too. We talk about it. Look, Patrick Graham. Yes, there's some new players on defense, but for most part, the unit is kind of intact. They come back. They know the scheme. They know the language Patrick Graham uses. The offense is at a disadvantage there. They just need some time, and it's early, like you said. So so learning a new scheme. Of course, the offense is going to struggle. We heard reports. Uh, on on Tuesday that, you know, the quarterbacks didn't look so great. They were having – well, yeah, of course, you're learning terminology. You're learning the plays. And and those guys, both Minshew and Aiden O'Connell, very smart dudes. So I'm sure they got the playbook. But when you get out on the field and you're having live action against the defense, it all changes, and you have to wait for that. That's why this mini camp is important because at least they get a flavor of it. So when they come back next month for full camp, they at least have uh, more of a familiar – kind of uh, ring, it has a more familiar ring, I should say, to those quarterbacks and to the rest of the offense because the offensive line needs to understand the cadence of the quarterbacks. They, obviously, with new guys on that line, like Jackson Powers Johnson, he does, he's not worked with O'Connell or Minshew, and then the other guys haven't worked with Minshew. So so you, you would expect that. And so we'll hear a little bit. Uh, Nate Hobbs had some interesting things to say about the quarterback battle, which I was really, 
really excited to hear him talk about because it's something we've talked about. So we're going to get into that. And then, of course, in the second segment today, we will get to your calls and your text messages on the Raider Nation mailbag. Uh, Mo, we, we talk about um, the defense, right? And, and ex- actually, Max Crosby, of course, uh, is is just is just a peach of a guy. I, every time I hear him talk, as he matures, as he goes on in his career, I, I just love how he keeps it real and he talks about it. And I think that he is such an important cog in that wheel for everybody on that team, not just the defense, because there's no one who works harder. And he has a sense for what it's going to take for this team to make a step, to go from missing the playoffs by one, two games, however you want to look at it, to being a team that actually competes for a playoff spot in the AFC. Um, Talk a little bit about that because I I know people love Max Crosby. They respect him. They hear all the national praise. But on a team like this, where you're starting to put new pieces together, you have some old familiar faces, that leadership is key. It doesn't always have to come from the quarterback position. It can come from somebody like Max Crosby. And clearly, he's the guy setting the tone. Well, now it has to come from a guy like Max Crosby because he's one, he's been there. He's one of the longest tenure Raiders now. No Derek Carr is <laughs> not there. Josh Jacobs isn't there. They came in the same draft class. But now you got a young, you got a young second year quarterback in Aiden O'Connell. You got a veteran who's coming in. Vic Tafer said that Garden Mitch is still getting his feet wet. Devontae Adams is a Raider and he's a he's an all pro, but he hasn't been there as long as Max Crosby. So Max Crosby's been through some of the highs, some of the lows mediocre years too and he understands like he understands now like look i've been playing at a high level and the wins haven't translated the way we wanted it to and we're gonna we're gonna him talk about you know it's we'll see what it looks like on the field but he can put things in into perspective as a guy who's played at a high level as a guy who's you know had a taste of the playoffs didn't go as planned as a guy who's, who's seen the low seasons been through multiple coaches, been through multiple coordinators. He can kind of set the tone and also keep the guys on even keel and put things into perspective um, on the, on the practice field. Well, and he's invested, right? You know, anything can happen. Uh, but but Max Crosby, uh, we 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 talked about him talking about UFOs and conspiracy theories last show just for fun, and people loved it, by the way. But um, he also, when he was talking to Jim Rome and a couple other interviews he did uh, last week, he talked about wanting to be a Raider for life. And he means that. So so he, he got his contract. He got his raise this year. So we'll see how things go. But here's a guy who not only wants to be a Raider for life, but he wants to get this team. He feels, I, I think, just by the way he speaks about it and what he said, he feels it's his responsibility to get the team there. Now, he can't do it all himself. He needs a quarterback to, to step up and lead this team offensively. But at the same time, uh, it, it's really great to hear that because I, I, it's authentic. You know, guys will say things because they're in a city or on a team. But with Max Crosby, you never get the sense that he isn't being completely genuine about that. Right. I think part of that is part of leadership. You have to be genuine. You have to have guys who believe in what you're saying. Uh, coming from the defensive side of the ball, it's, it sounds great. But when Max Crosby is not on the field, You know, on offense, that quarterback position is the leadership position. So hopefully he sees a little bit of that in Aiden O'Connor or Garner Minshew, whoever starts with the Rangers this upcoming season. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to play this clip, and we'll come back and talk about it, this clip of Max Crosby. um, And this was on Tuesday when him and uh, Nate Hobbs and uh, Jacoby Myers were made available to the media after uh, the first day of minicamp. Uh, and 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 they talked about the question really for Max Crosby was, does it feel different this year? Is you know is it better basically? Do you feel like this is this is a different squad and all this kind of stuff? And and his his comments are telling. And I and I want to I want to get this. And I think it shows the focus. And back to your your great point, Mo, about leadership and setting the tone. Because yes, we're not going to learn a ton out of minicamp on where this team's going to go. Who's going to win out this job, that job, especially quarterback. But you, it starts to set the tone because everybody's there. It's mandatory. So everybody's in camp. So here's Max Crosby. Said, you know, it's just you can't get too caught up in the hype, the noise, the things like that. We've been, you know, we've been a preseason Super Bowl contenders and also preseason we're going to lose every game. So all that shit doesn't matter. You know, we just got to be ourselves. 
um, focus on what's most important, and that's the work, the process. Um, you know, working even when you don't feel great. Um, that's what it's really about because right now everybody's healthy, everyone's happy, everyone's, you know, sun's bright. Uh, you know, things are smooth. You don't have games. You don't have extra media attention. So everything's rainbows and, and butterflies. But when the real bullets are flying, that's that's when you figure out who, who your guys are. And, um, you know, for me, that's why I just try to stay present um, because I've been in those been you know been in those situations many many times um and we got guys that are also you know in that position but we got a lot of new guys as well so we just got to keep improving and focus on what's most important so there you go max crosby and leadership right i mean that you watch that clip of max crosby mo and you know we're not here as we always talk about we're here to be objective and and so we're not technically rooting but man you watch max crosby from a leadership standpoint and i mean take a, i don't care if he was running a freaking in and out burger or whatever it was. This guy, he's setting the tone. He's setting the message to the younger players and the veterans that listen. Yeah, everybody feels good right now because you're not aching. You're not hitting anybody. You're not playing other competition. Uh, but it's important, I think, to note that. He says, look, you know, I've been in this position. Max Crosby's been through everything with this team, the Gruden stuff, uh, all the jazz with, with McDaniel, all that stuff. Uh, and so he's he's in essence, he was given sort of a cautionary tale there to everybody to say, look, you might walk out of this camp in a couple of days and feel really great about yourself. But, man, the work hasn't even begun yet. Yeah. And that's kind of what I try to say, too, is that I don't get caught up in these June videos of guys <laughs> catching the football and making these throws or guys running around in their shorts. Like he said, it, it doesn't really mean – I don't want to say that it doesn't mean anything because you're now starting to build what you're going to have going into the season. So it's, you have to have the work ethic. You have to come into practice. You have to be dialed in. But as far as, like, what the team could be come week one, it's still a long ways from now, and you still have to put the work in. And the only way you're going to do that is if you if you show up to practices and you put your all into it, and then hopefully that translates into the regular season. But you can't get too, as he said, you can't get too caught up in what's happening right now. You just have to take it one day at a time, stack good practices. Right, and I think it's it's not to say – it's not to throw a wet blanket on Raider Nation, who's excited, I think, for this team because of not only guys like Max Crosby, because of Antonio Pierce, what he did last year – and the kind of vibe he brings to the team. And even Antonio Pierce a couple of days ago on Media Day said, hey, listen, it, we, it's great, and you hear me talking this, and I mean it, but at the same time, the guys know they got to go out and perform on the field. So for right now, for fans who are missing football and want their football back, want their team back in the Raiders, I get it. And and but But it's good to hear Max Crosby say that because I think, especially for younger players who didn't experience – all of the the garbage that happened last year under Josh McDaniels and and going back to John Gruden and all that stuff that 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 hey you got to focus on what's ahead and we got a lot of work to do if we're going to be competitive in this in this league and be a playoff team there's a lot of work to do now um the quarterback battle we heard uh, I saw a lot of the beat guys and reporters out there uh, during minicamp talking about how uh, the quarterbacks didn't look particularly well and that the offense was struggling. As we said, we expected that with a new system. But they talked to Nate Hobbs, and uh, I was looking through the Nate Hobbs comments to find something about the defense, but he actually – they asked him about the, the quarterback competition because obviously he's out there competing against those guys in drills, and he had some interesting things to say here. And I think it goes back to what you and I and a lot of folks that listen to this show and watch the show – focused on which is competition is great not only for these two quarterbacks in Aiden O'Connell and Gardner Minshew but also for this Raiders team to get the best offense they can get out so here's here's Nate Hobbs talking about the quarterback competition they going at it uh ALC had a hell of a day today he was throwing some balls I forgot you know even as a teammate I forgot he had in him you know what I'm saying and I know he got it in him but he was just making it Knowing again every day, like, I'm here. You know what I'm saying? You're going to have to work for this job. And then Minshew, he got me today on third and long. I know, like, what you say, I knew they was trying to have on me. Minshew at the top of the drop, gave me a little pump fake, and I broke on it. You know, most quarterbacks can't do that. They don't have that awareness. They don't have the poise. They don't have the, you know, they just trying to get the ball out third down. He gave me top of the drop, pump, broke on the ball, the high low, first down. So, and then he pointed at me after. That pissed me off. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't jump offside the next play in my head. 
<laughs> but, <laughs> but it, it's a hell of a – it's going to be down to the wire. But I just think it breeds excellence. You know what I'm saying? Either Each guy, it, it's no time for rest. You know what I'm saying? You bring the best out of you. You got it. Breeds excellence. I mean, I mean, what a great soundbite. I mean, it was funny, too, when he talked about getting pissed off and Gardner pointed at him. But um, that's what we talked about, right? And, and we haven't seen that in a Raiders camp. We have not seen it. When Derek Carr was there, he was the starter always, and they didn't really have anybody behind him that was going to push him. Now you have two guys who are going out, and he talked about how well he felt that Aiden O'Connell had then thrown some balls, man, that were incredible to him. And then you had Gardner Minshew showing the wherewithal with the pump fake and all that stuff that you would expect from a veteran quarterback who's been around a little bit. But that whole point at the end there about driving for excellence, uh, this is something where we talked about don't root for one guy over the other. Root for them both to do really, really well because that will make either quarterback, whoever wins out, be the best that they can possibly be for this Raiders offense. I think Nate Hobbs soundbite kind of summed up the quarterback competition. You have Aiden O'Connell who has the arm talent. I think a lot of people forget that Aiden O'Connell has the arm to stretch the field. So oh, you yeah. have to you have to def- cover all areas of the field with Aiden O'Connell on the center because he can make those deep throws. One, I want to be a little more accurate, but he could he could definitely make those throws as Nate Hobbs pointed out. And then you have the veteran savvy of Gardner Minshew where he could do things that you know, a second year pro may not be able to do because he just is, hasn't had the experience that Gardner Minshew has had. Remember, Gardner Minshew has started over 20, 30 games in his career. So there are things that he Gardner Minshew could see on the field that Raider defenders have to be aware of when they're in coverage because he could pump fake you out of your cleats and make you look silly and then point at you and piss you off. So <laughs> uh, you got the veteran savvy and you got the arm talent. So that's why it's going to be, to me, while the national media is probably not paying attention to this Raider quarterback, but I think it's going to be very interesting to see if Gardner Minshew's experience wins out or, or Aiden O'Connell's arm talent. Like yeah, and and I think you know, I've I've gone on record and, and said I believe, and I think you did too, that I believe that Aiden O'Connell has the advantage. Obviously, having been there last year, not because of the offense, but because of Antonio Pierce, what he proves. And so, is it his job to lose? Sort of. But look, for Aiden O'Connell to be the best he can be, to have a guy – I mean, this is why I think Tom Telesco's move to sign Gardner Minshew was such a great one. And Minshew was really one of only three quarterbacks that were worth, in my view, signing in the Raiders situation, and they signed him. And this is why you want to push your young player. And and we had the question over the last couple shows, what does Aiden O'Connell have to do to become the franchise quarterback? Well, he's got to be the best Aiden O'Connell he can be. And to have a guy like Minshew behind him or next to him, I should say at this point, not behind him, next to him, pushing him every day because he wants to win the starting job too is exactly what you want. So I think it it shows too the differences in the front office and the coaching staff versus last year with Josh McDaniels, who we know favored veterans and went out and got Garoppolo and you know all that jazz. I know it's water under the bridge now, but this is what you do. This is how you learn – if this guy, Aiden O'Connell, has it in him when he's pushed to become that guy. It's a true quarterback competition. Uh, that's what I've called it. It's probably it's probably going to be the most heated quarterback battle of the offseason. I know Minnesota's got a battle, but it seems like Sam Donald has an edge in that the Vikings are willing to take it slow with J.J. McCarthy. The Denver Broncos over there, a lot of praise coming on. Bo Nix right now. Jared Stidham is like an eighth-year veteran with – Four career starts, so it looks like Bo Nix is going to win that job. But the Raiders, you really don't know. And, and Nate Hobbs said it's going to come down to why. I said it's going to be a close battle as well. Now, again, I started off saying that Minshew's experience should help him, give him the edge. But thinking about it, going over the schedule, once the schedule dropped and I saw the Chargers first, again, you know, Kyle's played the Chargers twice already, seeing some of the same defenders, not the same scheme, but the same defenders, I think that really helps him uh, get the job, not get the edge, but the familiarity with his teammates, with the first opponent, favors Aiden O'Connell. Yeah, and it's interesting, too. I never thought about it. I was The other day I was looking through some of O'Connell's numbers, and I realized, oh, you know, Jim Harbaugh is pretty familiar with Aiden O'Connell, right, being in the Big Ten, Big uh, Ten at Purdue. So he's seen him in college. He hasn't seen him in the pros, obviously. 
He's got the film from last year to look at. So that'll be interesting. That's going to be just a dynamic, I think, uh, uh, opener for the Raiders, knowing going up against Harbaugh and the Chargers and not knowing what they're going to be and losing some talent they've they've had, obviously. But it, it's going to be interesting. And you're right. I think this this quarterback battle is the best in the NFL. Uh, just because of the closeness of it and and what's at stake for the Raiders, because the Raiders should make a jump. And if they make a jump, they need good quarterback play. So that's what makes it fascinating. But we'll see. We'll, it'll, it'll all come down to that. And and I love what Nate Hobbs there said, too. He said he thinks it's going to go down to the wire, which is exactly what you said several weeks ago, Mo. You said, hey, even if Aiden O'Connell wins, you think he's going to get pushed hard enough that, you know, it, Gardner Minch is going to make it a tough decision on Antonio Pierce to name a starter but that's exactly what you want. So good stuff. And, and I think that for fans out there listening or watching the show, that's exactly what you want because that's going to, you're going to get the best, whoever wins out is going to be the best guys. He will have earned it with stripes to, to get out there and become the starter quarterback for the Raiders as they head into week one against the chargers. So good stuff there from mini camp. And uh, we hope you enjoyed that and, and the discussion. All right. We're going to take our first break here on the Thursday edition of silver and black today an Odyssey sports original podcast. When we come back, we're going to get to your messages. Yes. It's time for the Raider nation mailbag. You're with Mo and Scott. This is silver and black today. Stay right where you are. And, Hey, everybody, welcome back to Silver and Black Today, segment number two, the home stretch here on the off season edition of Silver and Black Today. We are an Odyssey Sports Original podcast. If you don't already subscribe, do so wherever you get your audio. Please subscribe, download, and rate us. Yes. If you're, if you're listening to us on Apple, give us that five star. We'd appreciate it. If you're watching us on YouTube, hit the subscription button and the thumbs up and also the notifications bell. And of course, the chat is always good, having fun in the chat. A lot of talk about Aiden O'Connell in the chat, Mo. That's been the last few weeks. People, as I said, people are, and it's only gonna increase as the competition increases, which is great for the team, great for fans, everything. So it's it's gonna be fun as we roll into that. Um, we do have some calls, we have a text. I'm gonna read a text because we had a text, Mo, while you were gone. And um, I thought, I thought, right, that I read it, uh, and I, I don't think I did, because the person sent it again, and he's like, yeah, I didn't hear it. And I said, okay, well, we'll, uh, we'll get to it. And um, that is our guy, Raider Smiley, in Troutman, North Carolina. He's originally from Rochester, New York. Of course, uh, that's where also former Raider President Mark Bedane is from. Da, 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 little trivia. Also, he, also our the, guy, uh, Rock Raider. Uh, Ro yeah, five, five, yes, five. he's from Rochester, right? I think so. Yeah. Rock Raider. R is he in? Is he in North Carolina now too, though? Yeah. Yeah. And shout out to him. Shout out to him. I think his daughter just graduated. So shout out. Oh, to nice. Rock Congratulations. Raider, five, congratulations man. to your daughter. That's yeah. cool. You gotta love that. It's always a good feeling. I know. I enjoyed my two kids who've graduated high school and then college. And then I got some guys here who have not done that yet. So I got some more <laughs> to celebrate. So we'll see. Uh, but Raider Smiley says, could last season's defense greatness have been tad diluted by the fact that they struggled to score points? I feel as though in years prior with Derek Carr, we lost a lot of leads because of the defense and opponents having to air it out to catch up. Uh, and that is from Raider Smiley. Mo, what do you think? As far as the defense, uh, having to what catch up now or are you saying yeah i think he says that the greatness uh, has been diluted because of the offense being so poor that the defense is actually better uh than it was uh than than we think it was because um they 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 didn't have any help from the, there was no complimentary football if you look at it this way the Reds were ninth in scoring and they're getting a lot of love it, even at my employer bleach report we have the raises as a top 10 defense mm -hmm. so i i don't now there were there were times where maybe the defense had a couple of slips up slip ups here and there i don't i wouldn't put the Rays defense as great yet i would say it's really right. good i think it could take a step up with christian wilkins added to the mix but um i think they're right where where they should be right now as far as the national spotlight is concerned, because right now they're, cons they're considered a top 10 defense that could be top five, top three. And I think that's pretty much uh, what I think of the Raiders defense right now. Is it, is it Ravens 
2000 defense. <laughs> I don't I don't think it's there yet. So um, Mo, do you do you agree? I mean, I don't I don't want you to call out your employer here or, or the guys that you work with, but do you agree that going into the season they're a top 10 defense? Of course. I mean, if they were ninth last year in scoring and they and you add Christian Wilkins, now I still have questions about the cornerback position. I still think they need to add a veteran there. But I, I think it's a top 10 defense going into this year based on what they did last year, assuming that their guys stay healthy. That defensive line, I think I said it on the last show, that defensive line is going to be one of the best defensive lines in football with Max Crosby, Christian Wilkins, Malcolm Coons, Tyree Wilson, Adam Butler, John Jenkins. That's a stout line that you're going to have with a rotation. You're going to have waves of pass rush with those group of guys. But while I say it's going to, it's it's a great defense, I, I'm not there yet because I'm a consistency guy. I like to see things mm -hmm. year to year before I call it something great. I like to see it happen multiple years, not just one year. One year is good. But when you see it two years, three years, then you can start using the word great, top-notch, elite. Yeah, and some of these games that they have this year too, Mo, some of these road games like Cincinnati and others, you know, I think I think we'll learn a lot about that too. But to your point about consistency, I love the defense going in. I mean, I get it. I think I think even though they're getting a lot of love nationally, including from your publication at Bleacher Report, yeah. I do think that that people underrate what that defense means to that team and how it could propel them if their offense progresses. Their offense doesn't have to be a top 10 offense. But if their offense is efficient, scores, they have to score because that was a problem last year. They have to score. But I think the defense, we saw it with the Chiefs this year. I know, I know. But the Chiefs had a much better defense than they had in, in years previous, right? They had a good defense, but then it got a lot better. And so it made up for some of the deficiencies we saw that the Chiefs had, some of the struggles they had on offense. So I think that's where that's where you have to look at it. and that's why we've been focusing so much on Luke Getzey and and what that's going to do because at the end of the day I think the defense is going to go out there and and you're right. I think they'll be a top 10 defense, but you need your offense to be at least middle of the road or better for you to compete in the AFC. I think Raider Smiley is also also saying now that I replay what he said in in the well, wrote in the text yeah is basically had the offense been better maybe the defense maybe we would have been paying more attention to say wow this defense is actually better had the offense pulled its weight defense wouldn't be on the field so much right as we talked about we always talk about complimentary football right so if the offense is pulling its weight scoring points then the defense maybe have may have played a little better because they wouldn't be gassed they wouldn't be on the field for you know, 35 40 minutes in a game right. and maybe you get more plays out of it but you know we, we have no idea what, what that would look like because the Raiders did struggle to score points. So hopefully the Raiders score 24 more points this upcoming season, and then we could see that defense be well-rested, have a, have a rotation that could be on the field maybe less than 35 minutes a game, more 25 to 30 minutes, and maybe make more plays, and we'll find out. So like I said, I'm a consistency guy. I like to see it year to year. Hopefully the offense is pulling its weight this year and we see more from the defense, and then maybe then we can call it elite or great. Right. And you have, I mean, some of these young players too, if you can start, if, if Tommy Eichenberg is a rotational guy who can come in and have impact right away, then those are the types of things that make them even better. Now they're good enough now where they don't have to pressure him. They don't have to have him out there for a ton of snaps, but if they can work him in and he performs well, those are the types of things that I think can propel this defense to be kind of the talk of the NFL if they go out, like you said, and consistently are able to compete at a very high level and make a difference for this team. So good stuff. All right, Raider Smiley, there you go, man. We read it again. I felt like I read it before, but, you know, we want to take care of you. I want to make sure you, that you heard it, and I told you it would be on today's show. So we certainly appreciate that. All right, we're going to now go to our calls, and we're going to start with a bang, right, Mo? we got to start with Jacob from Fresno. He didn't call in last show. He's slacking or he's got summer mind on or whatever he's got on. So here's our good buddy, Jacob from Fresno. Hold your eardrums. Get my PhD. We'll see. But you know, guys, 
listening to all these insiders, all these beat writers, all these something else that rhymes with it. Anyway, <laughs> everybody's talking about these screens. All these screens, when the guys go from their break or whatever, they go to drink some water rather than, you know, chopping it up with one another and hanging out and telling the next joke or whatever water cooler conversations go on in the NFL. Rather than that, these guys are going straight from their practice and they're going in to look at what just happened, how they can get better, what they can do to fix the errors and mistakes that they made. And the coaches can come up and talk to them too. And so I posed the question this year. Everybody's talking about the Raiders X Factor. Is it Antonio Pierce? Is it Aiden O'Connell? Is it this guy? Is it that guy? What about communication? Mm. Because every insider that I've been listening to has been bringing up these screens. Your boy Q from Lockdown Raiders, you know, the uh, Hondo Carpenter. All these guys keep saying how different this thing is. Raiders have these two huge screens, and they're saying that there's this big advantage. What do you guys think? Is our X factor for the season this communication that we have with coaches and among players where they can see this instant replay of what just happened, basically. They can go over their mistakes, and they can correct them in real time rather than having to go get showered up, get changed, go get something to eat, and then a couple hours later you see your coach in the film room, and then you have to wait a whole other day to go start your whole thing. What do you guys think? Is that an X factor for the Raiders? You guys... Let me know. You take it easy. I'll go. <laughs> All right. There you go. Jacob from Fresno. And, and Mo, they, they do. They have these big screens out there. And I think that this goes to approach, right? This is about coaching. And even even doesn't matter what business you're in. When I was in the private sector in corporate America, I always told people who work for me, I said, listen, I'm going to always give you feedback. If we go into a meeting and you do something in a meeting that deserves praise or deserve some correction, or I need to give you some pointers on it where you could have done better. I'm going to tell you right after it happens because we learn that way when it's heat of the moment and, and it's in the moment feedback, you are more receptive to it because it just happened to, to Jacob's point, going to take a shower. So this approach that Antonio Pierce, Patrick Graham, and the guys on the staff there have taken with bringing these screens out and reviewing things that happened in video so they guys can see it played back to them is it an X factor? I, I think it is as part of how this team is approaching coaching and how this team is approaching reaching the players and having them understand what it is they want them to do. Whatever advantage you can use to help you get better, you use it. So I think this is these are this is one of the things where it may not have the biggest impact during a regular season because even during the games, you'll see after a play – Players go to the sideline, what do they do? They go right to the tablet. They go right Tablets, to the pads yeah. and, and look at things, right? I think it's it's great for practice purposes to, as you said, immediate correction is always good because you don't forget about um, – now, certain players and coaches can remember, have incredible recall. I've seen it from Sean McVay. I've seen it from Cal Shanahan. Incredible recall. But if you're a player out there on the field, especially if you're a young player, I think it's good to have that immediate feedback and reaction because it's like you said, still fresh in your mind and you can correct things right on the spot versus let things simmer, then go back out in the field. And then you have to kind of not relearn it, but you're going to have to do the play over and maybe you, you get another a second, third correction. I think it's best to have it immediate. And I think that's an advantage for practice purposes. Now we'll see if that carries over to the regular season, because as I said before, in, in the earlier segment right now, it's the install period. You're going mm. through, you know, certain concepts. You're, you're just installing things to make sure guys get a grasp of what's going on. So I, I think that that plays into the practice aspect of it. And you, again, you're hoping that it carries over into the regular season. Yeah. And, and again, I, the approach I like because one of the question marks, I, I still believe it, is that, look, Antonio Pierce, as, as, as well as people thought he did last year, this is the first full season, the first full off season, first full staff that he is in charge of. He is the CEO. So seeing something like this, you get insight into the approach and it's very different than the previous staff, right? Uh, overall and, and the previous CEO. So if you look at that and you say, okay, he's going at this a different direction to your point, what the impact is, we won't know, 
until we see how they play. Does it work enough to the fact that they correct these things so that when they come out to play week one, the first six weeks of the season, you know, they are uh, uh, clicking and very, very regimented and disciplined as, as Antonio Pierce says he wants his team to be. So, so I like it. I like the different approach and certainly it's something that should, I think, make people feel good about it. But again, we don't know the impact on it. So as far as being an X factor, I think there's so many different factors that, that come into play when you're trying to get a team to reach its full potential, especially under a new head coach with new people on staff, new players, all that. But we'll find out once they, as as he says, mm-hmm. once this resume on the field starts to fill itself out, we'll know exactly how it, what how how well it did if it had any impact at all. And we might hear players talk about it, say, "Yeah, back in camp we did this." So we'll see how it goes. But Jacob, Re- uh, great call. Go ahead, Mo. You got something else on that? Really quick note came out from Vic Tafer early this morning, and basically James Craig, the offensive line coach, gave a reason why they moved Dylan Parham over to right guard, basically huh? saying that. The Raiders are going to run more wide zone scheme, and then he, so he's more natural on the right side than he is on the left side. So it goes back to my point about installing things and, and maybe trying new th- things and tweaking new things and looking at it in real time to see how it works out. At practice, all of that stuff is important because you're you're still figuring things out. You're still experimenting, mm. especially with the offensive line, certain combinations, certain permutations and concepts. Well, and the Raiders have had problems, I think, and you talk about this all the time, my friend which is putting a player in the best position to succeed and where they best are fitted uh, in that roster. Because the Raiders have put guys at positions out of need versus where they actually excel. So moving Parham over to to right guard, um, to your point about being familiar with that position, uh, is a good one. So, So you like to see that too from the coaching staff. So good stuff. All right, Jacob and Fresno, appreciate the call, man. Now we're going out to our good friend, NorCal Raider. I don't need to tell you where he lives because it's in his name. Here we go. Hey, uh, hey, Mo. Um, this is NorCal Raider um, out of uh, Wilson, California, uh, which is Northern California. Um, <laughs> I'm just calling in regards to uh, you know the, the last podcast. I was listening to you guys about you know just ranking the back and quarterback, and that's why I go back to um, this past season when um, it was the draft time. We should have uh, traded Devontae. We could have picked up a a prospect, um, a prospect quarterback, somebody a little higher. In addition, with um, with Brock Bowers, I think we would we could have picked up, uh, and that's the reason that it doesn't make any sense why we kept Levante. You know, it, you know he was the old regime, he was the old plan. Um, I I just I hear a lot of Raider fans talking about Devontae, but it, it still doesn't make sense why we even have him because we don't have a quarterback to compliment him. And um, I I just feel I I feel like this season is going to be probably a six seven win season. Um, I don't mean to my trying to seem pessimistic or anything, but we didn't address the quarterback and the quarterbacks we have are back up. And, um, and, and I don't know about a coordinator, you know, like, since I'm, they talk about Tim Pierce, but a Tim Pierce is going to be basically, I figure him kind of be like Mike Tomlin, you know, he's going to depend on his, on his coordinators. So kind of like John Harbaugh, you know, like, you know, the big, the big thing about John Harbaugh, John Harbaugh was so good um, is because he got a good drafter. And the only thing that we have is positive is that we have um, our new GM that um, will start drafting. Those kind of take time for it to build. So um, he's going to depend a lot on his coordinators. But, I mean, that's all I got. I just I just, I just, just wanted to see if hopefully they would pick up a quarterback, you know, somebody that can at least say, hey, you know, there's promise, you know, but – We'll see how it goes. If not, we can pick up one next year. But um, you know, still ready to You know, still optimistic about the season. A little pessimistic at the same time, but that's all I got. Thanks, guys. All right, there you go, NorCal Raider. Well, we've <laughs> talked. We've, we've talked about <laughs> Devontae Adams before. Uh, and the, on the quarterback thing, just real quickly, and then I'll let you talk about Devontae Adams because you have a great, great point of view on why not to trade him. But you've also said in the last couple of weeks, come the trade deadline, if the Raiders, if, if NorCal Raiders, right and they're at six wins, seven wins it tops, then watch at the trade deadline because that might happen. But the quarterback situation, listen, from everything we can understand, they really – they had one quarterback that they really liked at the top of the draft, okay, and they couldn't get him. And so if you can't get him, you don't want to overpay for a guy that you're not in love with, right? So if that's the case, then you go to plan B, which they signed Gardner Minshew and, and they had Aiden O'Connell. So that was their plan B. 
And so I get it. I think a lot of fans are in the same position. Why are we keeping Devontae Adams when we don't have that stud quarterback? Um, I get it, but I also think that timing is everything. And 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 the fact that Devontae wants to be a Raider is you give it some time. And yeah, if the wheels fall off, God forbid, if the wheels fall off and the Raiders don't do well this season or as well as they can, then then you start to think about that. The timeline has to make sense here, Scott. No Kyle Raider, I, I'll say this about the Devontae Adams talk about trading Devontae Adams for you know for a trade piece. Now, I guess no Kyle Raider, your idea would have been would have been trade Devontae Adams before the draft and try to move up because if you look at the timeline of things, right? So you're not you don't want to trade Devontae Adams early because you don't know how the draft is gonna pan out, depending mm. on you know where you move in Devontae Adams and where you're moving up to. Because let's say you move up to into the top 10, but that still doesn't guarantee you the quarterback that you want. Let's remember where these quarterbacks went. Michael Penix Jr. went eight to Atlanta Falcons as a surprise. Yeah. Unless you unless the Rays were okay with Bo Nix, you know, inside the top 10, then you're not moving your your best wide receiver to get you don't know what. You know, you don't know what you're moving up for because unless you're one, you don't know what's going to be available to you. So after the fact that they felt the Raiders see that these quarterbacks come off the board, Bo Nix comes off the board to the Denver Broncos, right? I believe at 12, then you're not going to force draft a quarterback just because you need to develop, you want a developmental guy because the next quarterback at the Bo Nix was, I believe in the fifth round, Spencer Rattler. So just yeah. take a look at that gap. Uh, none of the quarterbacks are really worth bringing in and saying, okay, that quarterback can compete right away. I thought Spencer Rattler may have had a chance because of all his collegiate experience between Oklahoma and South Carolina, but the Raiders felt differently, and Spencer Rattler wasn't picked to the fifth round. So at this point now, you're just hoping that you have Devonta Adams there to elevate your quarterback, whoever it is, whether it's Aiden O'Connell or Gardner Minshew. Uh, but I will say, and I and you brought this up, and I'll say it again, the Raiders fans are not going to want to hear this, but if the Raiders aren't a good football team by the trade deadline, I guarantee you you're going to hear more Devontae Adams trade buzz. Do the Cowboys want him? Does this team that needs a wide receiver want them? You're going to hear that because there are some people out there that feel the Raiders are going to fall into another rebuild. I know that the R word is a dirty word on this show to Raider fans, <laughs> but if, if they're somewhere like – you know, four and seven, four and six, people are going to say, well, are they headed for another rebuild? And I brought up the point that Devontae Adams' contract, the way it's structured, is very interesting. He doesn't have any guaranteed money in the last two years of his deal. So the Raiders, he has a very flexible contract. Now, he said this is where he wants to be. Tom Telesco said Devontae Adams is a Raider. We'll see if that changes depending on where the Raiders are at the trade deadline because we all know coaches and head coaches say these things. And then the plans change based sure. on how the season goes. So I'm just preparing you all. If it's not a good start to the season, this, this conversation is going to come up again. But if the Raiders are in the mix, if they're close to 500, hovering around 500, then I think it goes to my point that you keep Devonta Adams to help your quarterback, whoever that is. Right. And and if they do end up moving him, I mean, you, you got to think about how things unfold during things are crazy, right? You see, you see, we saw what happened with uh, Rogers last year, four plays out for the year, right? Mm -hmm. Suddenly you might have a team the the Baltimore's, the, the Buffalo's of the world who, who are, are, are favored to get to an AFC championship game or NFC championship game on the other side, the Eagles, whoever, they have somebody go down with an injury and suddenly in the trade market, they're willing to give you whatever you want for Devontae Adams because they're running for a Super Bowl. And um, suddenly you're in a great position too. So to your point about timing being everything, I think that's it. Hopefully the Raiders don't have to worry about trading him because they do well enough where it's not a, a, even a question. Uh, if they're competing for a playoff spot, then you don't have to worry about that. But uh, but good stuff. I hear a lot of people talking about that. It's not that they don't like Devontae Adams uh, or that they don't want the team to do well. They're just starting to look towards the future. And I get that. You have to do that. And you don't have, uh, unless one of these guys proves us wrong this year, you don't have the franchise quarterback. So people want that franchise quarterback. They just want to know what the future is going to be. Unfortunately, unless you're Mostradamus, you don't know what the future is. So, uh, but thank you, man. NorCal Raider, appreciate that very much for the call by the way if you want to call in for tuesday's show or want to text us it is 702-900-7869 702-900-7869 leave your name city and your question or comment or if you want to text us to that same thing make sure you put your name in there because i get some texts without names 
And so uh, I can't give you credit. I want to give you credit. So make sure you do that. 702-900-7869 is the number for the Raider Nation mailbag. All right. Our last call of the show is a, a, a guy who's identified himself as Josh Jacobs' old number. I, I don't know why, but that's – that, well, I don't know. We'll, we'll hear. Here he is. Hey, guys. This is Josh Jacobs' old jersey number. <laughs> Man, what a – what a boob that guy was, huh? Change it to number eight. Because it helps, you know. The only thing, you know, Josh was good at was hiding cheesecake, okay? Bad weight, not in shape. I mean, the running award he got was from stiff arming his kids to the bathroom last year, okay? <laughs> it's a lot of cakes, all right? Now I'm I'm worried for Zamir. Zamir White going for number thirty-five to three. You know Zeus is supposed to be the god of thunder, not the god of butter. Okay, like <laughs> it, it, this could be a scene. You know, in the locker room. You know, they win a game. They're all lighting up cigars. You know, Zamir is working on his third push pop. You know, like I don't know. Maybe there's no connection. You know, I I don't know. I just – maybe we should sign, like, Lamont Jordan, you know, like if <laughs> the mayor's out of shape going into camp. Because there'd be nothing more you know, motivating if I'm Zamir to see an old, fat running back get snapped in front of me. I'd put the reef uh... you know, peanut butter cups down fast, all right? Yeah. And I was just thinking, oh, Josh Jacobs old jersey number, that's right. I'm uh, This is Sincere McCormick, and uh, I don't know if I'm going to make the roster, but – I figured I would just talk some smack since the guy's not on the roster, and he he took my uh, my uh, I think he took my ho hos, you know. <laughs> Anyways, you guys uh, you guys have a good summer. Uh, I'm gonna try to try to make sure somebody does this number right. There you go. Josh Jacobs' old number. Josh Jacobs' old number. He, wow. he got me hungry. I want a snack now. He talked about ho hos. I'm not a fan of cheesecake, but no. Not you know, the cheesecake, ho hos and peanut butter cups, man. Yeah, he he had all the snacks on that call. He did. Man, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to run out to the bodega because you know. I'm but, <laughs> but you and I had talked off the air about via text one day. I don't know how we count into the conversation, but about because <laughs> he's talking about numbers. Like I I do see. And I just say this based on discussion I see around because I don't. It's not like I spend a lot of time in the Philadelphia Eagles uh, area or on their Twitter handles and all that stuff. But I've I've never seen fans talk more about players' numbers and jerseys than I have with Raider Nation. Right? It it there's a, there's a there's a strong and it's a positive thing. I'm not I'm not saying it's negative. With jersey, I I see people post and they have like 50 Raiders jerseys. So when they get a new guy like Brock Bowers, so they go get a Bowers 89 jersey and then they got, you know, this jersey and that jersey and then Josh Jacobs changes his number and then they were pissed because that and I get that because, you know, hey, you buy you spend that much money now on a jersey unless you're buying the fake ones from China. Um, they're expensive, but it, that's the level of fandom that you don't find in a lot of I think, look, fans have jerseys all over the league, but Mo, there's no there's no comparison to the investment both emotionally and financially that Raider nation makes when it comes to their, when it comes to their guys. So Josh Jacobs old number has good taste in snacks. minus the cheesecake, of course, <laughs> but I, I, I'm just curious. It, are, are you, are you not a fan of running backs taking single numbers? I, I, I want to know, you know, people in the chat, if you hear, if you're hearing this, obviously you are in the chat, but are you a fan of running backs with single digit numbers or mm -hmm. do you want to run it backs, to, you know, have numbers in the twenties and, you know, low thirties. I, I like number three versus 35 for Zamir. Josh Jacobs in eight seems weird, I guess, cause I'm so, I was so used to seeing him in 20, you know, he had eight at, at Alabama, but yeah, I I'm, I'm lukewarm on running backs with these single digit numbers. I, I like my running back. I'm, I guess I'm a traditional guy. Maybe I'm old like that. I know you're yeah. probably looking at me like old, but I mean, I'm used <laughs> to seeing running backs in the twenties and I like, you know, I just, the single digit for the running back, especially three. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I like it, but it's going to take me, 
it's going to take me a while to get used to that. Well, and the, the rules have changed over time. Remember, so so because I'm much older than you and, and probably <laughs> most of the people who watch us, um, is when I was a kid, I remember they switched it and receivers, uh, tight ends and receivers had to be in the 80s, right? So 80 to 89. And there were old receivers who had numbers that were in the teens and they were able to keep it. They were grandfathered in, excuse the expression. They were grandfathered in. So you saw guys like Tyler Joyner. You saw, I'm trying to think of somebody else uh, that had a teen number. Um, but but they, they had those numbers, they kept them, but everyone else coming in the league had to have 80s. Then they switched it out. And then I want to say in the 90s, you could be a receiver and have a teens number. So 10 through 19 again, and then you could have 80s. Now they switched it where it's like anything goes, right? So you can be a defensive end and have number one. Um, and so it's much more like they do in college. Uh, so they've mimicked the college level because that's why Josh Jacobs changed his number in the first place, right? Because that's what he had in college. And you see some of these guys coming out of college now that want their college number and they can get it now to, no matter what position they're at because the NFLs relax those roles. I don't know why that was a big deal. Maybe the players, says, I don't know. It's a very interesting question. But yeah, it seems for those of us that are older than 30, it seems unnatural sometimes to see a defensive end wearing number nine or or number 14. You know, it's like, well, what's going on there? But that's the way it goes. And maybe it is about selling jerseys too, by the way. I would say so. I guess that <laughs> that plays into it a bit. But like I said, it, it, it's just weird because I've watched some college tape in my time. And I, and I always thought it was weird to see, you know, a, 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 he said defensive lineman coming off the line. He has a single digit number. And because I'm just so used to watching NFL football where certain positions have a certain range of numbers. And if you watch, if, you, if you're if you a person who goes back and forth between NFL and college, you know that your brain has to adjust to that on the, on the collegiate level to seeing a certain number in a certain position, especially yes. if you're watching film versus in the NFL, you're expecting okay, this number, this position. Because sometimes that helps you identify who the player is because you're trying to keep track of names and this player, this jersey. It, it's it's tough. It's tough if you're switching back and forth. But, I, again, I like Zamir White three versus 35. I still like 35 for a running back. It's not my thing. Uh, but – as far as you know, defensive linemen having single digits, <laughs> not not really a fan of that. Uh, Tyree Wilson. Um, yeah, and 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 for me, <laughs> like growing up, if you were a running back and you had a 30s number, you were a fullback. Yeah, right? I was gonna say you were a bigger running back or a fullback. Which is interesting. It's just it's just when you were coming up, it's just different. And so so now the discussion on numbers and whatnot, it's 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 just it's fascinating to me because yeah, it's changed a lot. Um, but yeah, to have him wearing number three, I agree. It looks better to me for some reason. It just looks better than 35, right? You, you single digits or the teens numbers, you just expect them to be skilled players on offense. And so, so it gets you kind of uh, rolling with that, but we'll see, you know, I mean, Hey, there's, there's a, and I had some people, you know, when the great, um, Jim Otto passed away recently, uh, we saw a lot of Raider fans because of course we know the Raiders don't retire numbers. But they they were saying, hey, they should just retire double zero for the Raiders, even though it's ceremonial, because you can't wear a double zero in the NFL. The NFL last year allowed zero back in. It was not allowed before. Now zero is back in and there's guys wearing it, but double zero. And I I would say that they already have ceremoniously uh, uh, retired his number, because if you go to the wall at Allegiant Stadium now, which is part of the Raiders Hall of Fame, you'll see double zero up there. So they clearly on it. And nobody will ever wear it again unless the NFL decides to bring back double zero, which I, I don't anticipate, but you never you never know. They're yeah, going to bring in know. fractions next. You never know, Mo. <laughs> um, three and numbers. one third. <laughs> <laughs> Decimal numbers. Dewey Decimal System. Decimals. There you go. So all fun, all good stuff. All right. That's going to conclude the show for today. Appreciate all the calls and the text messages. Make sure you do that. Send them back in uh, next time for next show. 702-900-7869 is the number. 702-900-7869 to be part of Silver and Black today, which we love to have our listeners and viewers part of the show. Mo, I know you got something up on uh, sports not today tell everybody about it so they can go read it some people don't want to read your stuff don't want to read my stuff but we're telling them about it anyway because if you want a further discussion on the raiders we go in depth when we're typing and writing 
Raiders pre-training camp to-do list. What the Raiders need to do before training camp starts late July. Bunch of contract stuff that maybe we we talked about on the show a little bit. I mentioned Devontae Adams. Two additions that the Raiders still need to make to their roster. The Raiders have 91 players on the roster, by the way. There's one exemption from the International Player Pathway Program. Uh, so if they add someone, they have to let go of someone. Just keeping that in mind. I also have a Bleach Report live on Friday where I'll also dig into what I wrote about on Sports Now, just in case you don't want to read it. <laughs> you can hear me talk about it on Bleach Report Live. <laughs> what do the Raiders need to do before a training camp? Because there are five things that I feel that need to be done to the roster before they reconvene in July. There you go. So uh, you can catch Mo live tomorrow on Friday. Bleacher Report Live. Get the app. If you have Roku at home or one of the other streaming devices, by the way, you can watch it on the TV at home, which is what I do. And for some reason, my dog keeps barking whenever Mo's on the screen. I don't know. I don't know. No, I'm kidding. But yeah, I like watching it on the Roku. It's good stuff. Uh, obviously, on your phone, you can you can communicate and, and ask Mo questions or pester him like I do every once in a while um, with comments that his producers ignore. But nonetheless, <laughs> we, we can uh, we can uh, make sure that you uh, follow that. It's, it's good stuff. Uh, we'll be back on Tuesday. And again, uh, we appreciate you guys being with us. Do us a favor, subscribe to the pod, 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 podcast. Yes, that's what it is. That's how you say it. Podcast, the audio version up anywhere you get your audio. Please uh, subscribe, rate, review. We appreciate that as always. If you're watching us on YouTube, thanks again for being with us and appreciate the lively chat as always. For our producer, Mike Robbie, for Momotin, I'm Scott Branson. This has been Silver and Black Today. We'll see you next week. <laughs>